Located on the banks of the Mississippi River, New Orleans has served as a major port and focus of transportation for over 200 years. Steamboats and steam railroads became the defining symbols of the Crescent City's importance in moving goods in, out, and around the country. But the power of steam gave way to diesel and turbine power. Steamboats now carry tourists on cruises along the historic New Orleans riverfront, but steam railroading disappeared from the city in the mid-1950s. The last time a steam train ran in regular service in southeast Louisiana was in 1963. Then, a small narrow-gauge locomotive named Bertha hauled sugarcane from the fields of Westfield Plantation to the mill during the harvest season. When the 1963 sugarcane season ended, so did regular steam railroad service in Louisiana. Steam railroading renewed its presence when the Southern Railway operated special excursions in the 1970s and early 1980s. Several different steam engines visited the city, making round trips to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. One of the favorites was locomotive 4501, painted in the Southern Railway's famous green passenger colors. These excursions gave many New Orleans rail fans a chance to experience the sights and sounds of steam railroading. The last steam trains to visit New Orleans came to town for the 1984 World's Fair. After the fair, steam railroad whistles were not heard again in New Orleans for many years. As the 20th century turned into a new millennium, the hissing sound of steam and the notes of a whistle were again heard echoing off the levee, tucked away a couple of miles downriver from the French Quarter. On a brisk, sunny fall morning, locomotive 1744, a former Southern Pacific steam engine built at the beginning of the 20th century, was warming up for a test run. Its new home was the New Orleans and Gulf Coast Railway in Belle Chase, Louisiana. The locomotive had been lovingly restored and was ready to start pulling trains of happy rail fans on an hour-long trip along the banks of the mighty Mississippi River. It was called the Big Easy Steam Train. For anyone who wanted to take a ride into the past, the 1744 would be their ticket. Locomotive 1744 was built as a mogul-type engine with two pilot wheels and six drive wheels, a 260. The life of the 1744 began in November 1901 in the Baldwin Locomotive Works factory in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with builder's number 19671. It was built for the Southern Pacific Railroad and was delivered to its new home rails at El Paso, Texas. Over the next 55 years, the engine underwent many changes and took on a look that many rail fans identified as classic Southern Pacific. It saw a major rebuilding in 1912 at the Southern Pacific Shops in Sacramento, California, and was superheated in 1919. The 1744 spent the last years of its working life hauling trains near Los Angeles. Joe Dale Morris always had a passion for steam locomotives. The bug bit him when he was a boy as he grew up around trains. Joe Dale is the sort of person that makes an instant impression on anyone. His Texas drawl and his big smile are stereotype examples of his good nature. Joe Dale has been involved in the restoration of other steam locomotives like former Southern Pacific No. 786 in Austin, Texas, and he took on the task of bringing the 1744 back to first-class shape. This locomotive was a Southern Pacific Valley Mallet. And the, the, the crews on the Southern Pacific called her a Valley Mallee because she could pull as much in the California Valleys as the Southern Pacific Mallets could pull in the mountains. Uh, she, was, she has 63 inch drivers and at 200 pounds of boiler pressure, she's very, very comfortable with 50 to 75 cars at about 35 to 50 miles an hour. She's a lot of fun to run. It's, she's an easy girl to run. She tells you exactly what she wants. It's hard to hold her back with 63-inch drivers on our 10-mile-an-hour railroads. She wants, to, she wants to prance a little bit, but of course we can't. In 1956, 1744 was vacated from the roster, but stored in serviceable condition. It played a part in the 1958 Universal film, This Earth is Mine. In May of 1959, 1744 was donated to the Sons of Utah Pioneers and placed on display in Corinne, Utah. Then, in September 1980, 1744 was brought out of retirement and began working for the Heber Creeper Railroad. In 1990, it was sold to the Fort Worth and Western, where it sat unused, this time for nine years.
We oh, bought yeah. the locomotive yeah, late in 1999 from the Fort Worth and Western Railway in Fort Worth, Texas. The Rio Grande Pacific decided that we would restore the locomotive and rehabilitate it in Fort Worth, so we leased the site in Fort Worth, the old 8th Street Yard, actually where the Fort Worth and Western rebuilt the XSP 2248. Greg Dodd from the Great Smoky Mountain Railroad was our initial contractor and came down and helped me do a lot of this stuff, he and his crew. We did the boiler work in January and February. Uh, we replaced the top of the smoke box, half the top half of the smoke box. We completely fluted it yeah. and tubed it. Did the hydro and it came out just fine. The Federal Railway Inspector uh, came and when we did the, high, uh, the hydro and, uh, and passed it uh, in good shape. The task of restoring a steam locomotive was a long and backbreaking process that could stress the calmest soul. So it was about March of 19, I'm sorry, March of 2000 that I moved to Fort Worth to, to take over the, the complete management of the job. Uh, I raised it and dropped the uh, pedestal binders and the shoes and wedges and, and uh, took the drivers out from under it, rolled the six drivers out from under it, checked all of the driving boxes, rebabbited uh, uh, several of the driving boxes and returned all of them to match the bearings on the, on, on the axles. We had to... Uh, to work on, uh, replace some things on, on, the, on the lead driver, and then we moved those back under. Um, by the 29th of August, we had a fire in her and moved her, uh, we snap tracked her out of where she was. I had to hire a track contractor, and they built about 300 yards of track. And under her own power, we snap tracked her right out of, right out of her, uh, her bay on an 8th Street yard and put her on the Fort Worth and Western Main Line, and that's where we started breaking her in. The 1744 emerged from the shop as a 99-year-old lady that acted like an Olympic sprinter. The Federal Railroad Administration performed a steam test in September 2000, and the 1744 hauled its first train two days later for the Burlington Rock Island Historical Society. Two days after that, 1744 pulled a school special. Loaded onto flat cars in Fort Worth, the engine and its tender were shipped to the New Orleans and Gulf Coast Railway in November. A track gang erected a ramp designed to hold the weight of the locomotive as it was unloaded. Weighs about 75 tons empty. It's about 45 feet long by itself. But the 1744 was not quite ready for pulling trains. The indicator boards up next to the stack were stolen from our uh, storage bin in Fort Worth shortly before I bought the locomotive. Uh, and I hadn't realized that, but a friend of mine, uh, Richard Losey, who lives in Washington, uh, has, an, has a deep Southern Pacific Railroad background, grew up in Roseville, and he actually had a pair of brand new indicator boards from the Southern Pacific that his dad had bought when they desalized. So Richard was kind enough to, to donate the indicator boards see them there, a brand new set of indicator boards to us, uh, or I was simply going to have to get the drawings out and try to get a tin shop to build them. So uh, we had one of our headlights stolen, of course the pile uh, 14 and a half or 15 inch sport model headlamps are on the front and on the back. One of those was stolen when they took the, the indicator board and uh, I found a headlight on eBay and, and called the man and he told me what he wanted. Uh, uh, we struck a deal. I told him what I wanted to use it for. Uh, we struck a deal, and, and I bought it over eBay. He sent it to me, and uh, William Balson in Fort Worth took the two headlights to his personal shop at home, and over about a, a month period, completely rebuilt them to better than new. The Pilot, it's a, it's, a, it's a number two or number three combination, AAR combination pilot, which was required by the Association of American Railroads and the Interstate Commerce Commission if the locomotive was going to be used in, uh, in local service where you would have switchmen on and off. They had to have a place to get on and off, so they required them to put footboards along with the pilot. The railroad's SW9 diesel switcher coupled on to 1744 and pulled her clear so the crew could complete their task.
tender was brought down the same way and eventually engine and tender were safely on the ground. The track gang immediately started to take down the ramp and the engine crew went to work to join the engine to the tender. Like any steamer, the 1744 required lots of lubrication and the spring bumper between the engine and tender got a healthy dose of grease. The diesel switcher eased the steamer back until the drawbar and stabilizers slid into place. The crew's next job was to add the pilot, headlight, and footboards and make all connections that would make a working steamer out of its various parts. The New Orleans and Gulf Coast Railway was originally built in the late 1800s by Missouri Pacific and was called the New Orleans and Lower Coast Railroad. It reached Empire near the mouth of the Mississippi River. The road became a branch line of the Union Pacific with the Missouri Pacific merger in 1982, but when Union Pacific sold the line in 1990, new owner Railtex readopted the New Orleans and Lower Coast name. The New Orleans and Gulf Coast Railway was formed in April 1999 when the Rio Grande Pacific Corporation bought the line. The new railway included just over 24 miles of the original line along the Mississippi River from its interchange with the Union Pacific to Myrtle Grove, Louisiana. Wednesday, November 29, 2000, dawned clear and mild. 1744 sat quiet in the roundhouse. The name workers gave the engine storage track near the railroad's temporary depot. Steam engines have always required plenty of attention and 1744 was no different. The crew spent four hours to warm up the steamer and build up enough pressure to operate. This is called a Johnson bar or reverser. It's what sets the valve travel on the cylinders that emits, that emits the steam into the uh, cylinders from the boiler. And you can adjust the valve travel to get the amount of steam that you need. This is a throttle that uh, allows the steam to travel from the boiler to the cylinder through the valve. These are the brakes. This is the, call the automatic or train brake that sets the brakes on the train. This is the independent or engine brake. Crew members also had to oil and grease the engine each day to keep it in top shape. Every 50 miles, the engine has to be greased and lubricated real well, and we have several different kinds of grease and oil that we use. We use alamite grease, which is a real hard grease that goes into the main rods and the pins on the main rods, and that has to be shot in there with an alamite grease gun. And we also have regular automotive grease that goes in smaller grease fittings like our power reverser and some of our Stevenson uh, gear linkage. Then we also have some valve oil that we use to lubricate our steam cylinders and we use that on the Stevenson linkage as well. We have eccentrics that are on the number two driver axle that run blades that in turn move the Stevenson link blocks and all of that stuff has to have valve oil and uh, journal oil put on them I would say about every 25 miles we need to put some on there. Then there's air oil that we use in the Westinghouse air compressor that we have that's steam operated and also in the power reverser to keep the cylinder free and going pretty good. Guests have usually been found on test runs. Today, half a dozen people would ride the cab of 1744. All right, men, let's help our guest engineer up. The 
The preparations were complete, parts were oiled, steam pressure was up, and it was time to take her out. Joe Dale, a certified steam locomotive engineer, operated 1744. He checked his pressure, put 1744 in reverse, released the brake, and gave three short blasts of the whistle, signifying he was ready to back up. He slowly opened the throttle, and the 87-ton engine started to move. For the test run, 1744 pulled two commuter coaches and a pair of diesel F units. With no way to turn the locomotive around at the end of its runs, the steamer would always pull southbound and the diesels would pull northbound. 1744 slowly backed up, paused briefly while the switchman threw the switch, and then backed out onto the main line. I'm very proud of the restoration we did. I, I restored this engine using, uh, using Southern Pacific specifications, uh, spec sheets, uh, as if she would have come out of the Los Angeles General Shops in 1955. I had uh, paint cards for the paint, for the seat and sash paint. I had that matched perfectly with the seat and sash paint, uh, the injectors, the uh, check valves, the windows uh, are all painted with Southern Pacific seat and sash red, which is really the 1937 color that the Southern Pacific painted their freight cars that I found out later. The gray is the, the lettering gray. I went to the DuPont Dulux store and told them that I believe the number was 586. And the man said, just a moment, and he clicked up the computer and he said, this can't be right. You don't want Southern Pacific lettering gray, do you? And I said, that's exactly what I want. And so we got 15 gallons of Southern Pacific lettering gray still in the DuPont computer is Southern Pacific lettering gray. I had a, have a friend in Woodburn, Oregon, who had the specification sheets for the Southern Pacific alphabet. And his name is Frank Shear. And Frank took these down to a computer man in, uh, in Portland. And the computer man scanned the Southern Pacific letters in and made all of the stencils for the numbers on the cab, uh, the numbers on the tender. The only thing that we couldn't do uh, is we couldn't put Southern Pacific on the tender. Uh, the insurance companies and the Union Pacific now that owns the Southern Pacific name decided that they didn't want the liability, which I fully understand. And so uh, Rear Grand Pacific that owns the engine said, well, that's fine. Since we own the engine, we ought to put our own railroad on it anyway. So using the Southern Pacific letters, I had New Orleans and Gulf Coast done with Southern Pacific letters. And so it matches the historical integrity of the locomotive and all of the other lettering on the side of it. Uh, and if you look at New Orleans and Gulf Coast, uh, and you're not looking real hard, you, you can't hardly tell it from, from Southern Pacific anyway. So we think we did a good job. My first experience riding a, a steam train was when I was two and a half years old. At two and a half, you wouldn't imagine I would remember anything, anything much, but I remember it all. I remember being on the train. I remember uh, the, the sounds of, 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 the, of the train, the swaying of the cars. I'm one of these people that likes to see old time machinery operate, so I enjoy seeing a, a well-maintained and preserved and restored automobile, truck, locomotive, wherever it is operating. Out on the main line, 1744 ran alongside the levee of the Mississippi River.
She passed one of the railroad's major customers, Chevron's Oak Point plant. The whistle was getting a workout since the 24-mile railroad has over 240 grade crossings. What I see about 1744 is that this is a renewal of that so same sort of experience that I had when I was two and a half. As the sun set, 1744 reached the southern end of the run and the F-unit diesels took their turn to pull the train back to the depot. Even these engines had their place in railroad history, dating from the mid-1950s. F-units 410 and 104 were leased by the New Orleans and Gulf Coast freight trains over the line, but they were also up to the task of pulling passenger cars. Deep South is known for its mild winters. December 2, 2000 was the first day of revenue service for the Big Easy steam train, and the weather was kind to 1744, with clear blue skies and a temperature of 65 degrees. The concession car shined in its fresh red paint, but it was the only one of the railroad's own passenger cars that had yet arrived. The two commuter coaches used on the test run had been leased to provide seating for passengers. 1744 proudly stood on its ready track and visitors waited with tense excitement. Joe Dale again operated the engine for the first revenue run and knew how to please a crowd of rail fans. He made a big show of bringing the 1744 out and coupling to the train. to the area, something for rail fans to appreciate uh, that they uh, often travel around the country, if not around the globe, to ride, videotape, or just simply watch live steam in action. Um, it's an amazing spectacle to see something made of so much heavy cast iron and steel to simply be alive. Um, it's, it's an impressive sight. The sounds, the smells, it, it's, it's, it's an experience. Helped by crew members wearing traditional uniforms, the engine slowly coupled to its train. With that done, passengers boarded the train to the music of a Dixieland jazz band.
excited riders took their seats and got ready for the ride. It was a trip to the glory days of railroading when trains were the only way to go and they always did it in style. Most of the time when you rode the steam train around here, you rode in a non-air conditioning car. And if it was summertime, you'd have the windows open and the soot would come in because uh, the LN and the IC in the southern burned coal. And uh, those were the three main railroads that I would ride on. And so you'd get smoking cinders in your eyes. In the wintertime, when the windows were closed, it was much more comfortable. And uh, the car would be warm in the winter because they'd have steam heat in the cars. Most of all, my favorite was the senior citizen. And the senior citizen, some of them would just grab me by the arm and say, my great-grandfather was a conductor, or my grandfather was a conductor, or they would tell me about how such and such was an engineer, or how that person was an engineer in those days and how the steam engine, they would shovel the coal into the uh, engine and how what would, they would do when they would go through the tunnels, how they would have to cover themselves with a wet, wet towel if they, so they wouldn't uh, suffocate. And it was, it was just amazing just to listen to their stories and to see today the way we have it today and what they went through back, back then. 1744 carefully traversed the profile of the railroad, blowing her whistle for every crossing. She passed orange groves and rolled alongside the levee of the Mississippi River.
At the end of the southbound run, control was transferred to the diesels on the north end of the train. The classic F unit diesels were used to haul the train back to the depot. 1744 backed up for this part of the trip, but the whistle still spread brief notes across the countryside. Few rail fans and railroad employees were at the depot when 1744 and her train returned. The youngest of the fans was apparently oh, wow. pleased with the sight. It's wonderful to look out in that parking lot and see all the cars out there and, and all the people coming through here so excited today and um, just all the little kids and the grandparents bringing their grandkids and wanting to get a glimpse of the steam engine. Oh, we're just loving it. It's gorgeous out today. Everything just fell into place. For its second run of the day, the train brought riders north to a busier part of town. On the northbound journey, the classic F units led the train across the lift bridge over the Intracoastal Waterway. The bridge is a spectacular remnant of the original Missouri Pacific route now operated by the New Orleans and Gulf Coast. On its return trip, the train again crossed the lift bridge. The bridge was built in 1943 and to this day still operates to clear boat traffic on the waterway. As the train approached, the span slowly settled into place, ready for the 1744 and her passengers.
first revenue runs were successful and the 1744 settled into a routine of running several trips each week. Different combinations of motive power were tried out with the 1744. One day, the railway's SW9 diesel switcher led the train north of the depot. It was an interesting sight to see a freight locomotive pulling a passenger train with a steamer on the end. Passing through Bell Chase, the train rolled on its way. It traveled over a steel girder bridge that was still showing the Missouri Pacific Buzzsaw Herald. Later, the train crossed a wooden trestle over one of the area's drainage canals. Engineer Gary McCord showed off the 1744's whistle as it crossed the trestle. As the routine of operating the train settled down, diesel power was provided by Idaho Northern and Pacific F Unit Number 1112. It was lettered for a sister railroad to the New Orleans and Gulf Coast. This locomotive came from the Electromotive Division of General Motors in 1947 as Gulf Mobile and Ohio Railroad F3 Number 808B. It was rebuilt by the Illinois Central Gulf Railroad to pull commuter trains, then modernized and painted by the New Orleans and Gulf Coast. It wore the red and gold of the road's passenger fleet and provided diesel enthusiasts with the look of first-generation diesel motive power. The 1112 also provided head-end power for the train on all its revenue runs. A special generator inside the locomotive's body produced the power that kept the lights and air conditioning running in the passenger cars. A slight bulge in the sides of the diesel provided space for the generator. As the train ran north, interested spectators stopped along the highway or tooted their horns. The crossing of the Intracoastal Waterway showed the flat terrain of the area as the bridge was built only a few feet above the water level. Near the overpass of the busy West Bank Expressway, the engineer blew the signal for the grade crossing. A foolish driver darted in front of the train, narrowly escaping a serious accident. Sometimes the northbound train stopped behind a small shopping center. People would gather in the parking lot to watch the train leave on its southbound return trip. Other times, the train would go all the way to Gouldsboro, the northern terminus of the New Orleans and Gulf Coast Railway. 
Here, under the towering twin cantilever spans of the Crescent City Connection, the train ran down a neighborhood street. An important part of every trip was to sand the flues. Sand was sprinkled into the firebox to clean soot out of the flues and tubes running through the boiler. Clouds of black smoke billowed from the 1744 smokestack. While most mainline railroads in America have used long lengths of welded rail for smooth operation for many years, Short lines like the New Orleans and Gulf Coast Railway commonly continued to use jointed rails, 39 feet long and bolted together. This produced the traditional clickety-clack of the trains. The 1744 was built when jointed rail was the only type available, and the engine looked at home on it. The locomotive swayed and rocked as the engineer blew the whistle. Each engineer over the years gains a way that he likes to hear the whistle blow. It's called quilling a whistle, and no two engineers that you've ever ridden with or that you'll ever hear will quill the whistle the same. Each one of our wives over the years uh, will tell you that when we're coming in, they know that we're on the train by the way we blow the whistle. I quill it different, JR quills it different. Everyone that I've ever ridden with, all of my mentors, uh, all of the guys that have trained me over the years, uh, they're all different. But each one of us, on our own ear, uh, like to hear the whistle quilled a little bit differently. generations that never witnessed it. It is an impressive experience that they'll always remember. I've seen the, the uh, engineer invite young kids, and some big kids too, into the cab of the locomotive uh, to blow the whistle or ring the bell or whatever, and uh, it, it, they're creating uh, a, a lasting impression, an, an indelible mark into the minds of those that experience it. The people who ran the 1744 followed a long tradition of American railroading. The New Orleans and Gulf Coast version of this tradition included women in the fireman's seat and conductor's hat. It's, it's a labor of love. Um, I gave up my own business, and at, at the very suggestion that I would have an opportunity to do this, and told them that I wanted to be a hospital slash fireman. And I believe I was the first woman that they had seen that wanted to do that. So they laughed. They thought it was a great, funny joke. So they, they put me inside the firebox without a fire. 
there's one gentleman that I met on our train. Him and his family, his uh, wife, his brother, two brother-in-laws, had brought him aboard to ride the train, and he's a police officer from Alexandria. Well, the gentleman I didn't know, one of the brother-in-laws took me aside to ask me a favor. If uh, the gentleman could just go into the steam engine and just take a picture. And I said, yes, it would be no problem. Well, come to find out the gentleman was very ill, very ill. So what I did was I arranged a surprise bride for him. Not only was he surprised, but his two brother-in-laws were surprised, and they both started crying. So I had three of them crying. And one of the brother-in-laws uh, used to work with my husband. So they both rode the engine, and I have never seen a gentleman so happy in all my life. It is just unbelievable. A steam locomotive is a fun piece of equipment to be around because it kind of lives and breathes. It, uh, it could be just sitting there and uh, all of a sudden the air compressor will plug on and uh, it'll, it'll let out steam when the pressure builds up and uh, a lot of people have almost compared it to a man or a horse and of course the original nickname for locomotives years ago was the iron horse and it kind of does. Not only does it pull uh, when it's hard at work and pulling, it kind of uh, uh, gets down in labors and it almost has a, a living uh, way about it as com uh, compared to, say, a diesel, which just you mainly hear the, the diesel engine rev up a little bit and that's it. But it, yeah, it's fun to be around. But even as the train ran its normal schedule, the end of its operation on the New Orleans and Gulf Coast was set. The corporate powers that brought the train to New Orleans had decided to stop running it and put it up for sale. Joe Dale Morris was back for the final runs. Mr. J.R. Phillips was there too. Mr. Phillips had operated steam and diesel engines into New Orleans for the Louisville and Nashville Railroad for nearly 40 years. Both engineers operated the train on its final weekend. The runs all sold out and the bittersweet trips ran under beautiful skies. There were even a few moments that made the reality of steam train operation more immediate and enduring. The locomotive's injectors were acting up, not putting water into the boiler fast enough. Joe Dale stopped the train for a few moments and spoke to a lady who remembered steam trains as the only way to go. Nice to meet you, Miss Wallace. Pacific. Well, that is a handsome train. Thank you, ma'am. You know, I used to, when, when I was a kid, my mother took me from Arkansas on the Rock Island Railroad all the way out to California. And oh, man, that was a trip in those days. And you know, my mother-in-law was on a train one time, and they all had to get underneath the seats because Pancho Villa was going to attack the train. <laughs> Looking 
down at the tracks, seeing how they go. This is the neatest part. At first I was really scared of them, but not anymore. It's, it's just great just to see. And then too, just, you can even watch back in here. last run was done, Joe Dale and J.R. put 1744 into the roundhouse and dropped the fire. The hiss of steam and the music of whistles were gone. The clickety-clack of metal wheels on tracks was gone, and the rail fans of the area were left scratching their heads. Would it be 15 years before steam railroading would come back to New Orleans? No one knew where or when it might be seen and heard again. But for a while, the Big Easy Steam Train brought the early 20th century into the new millennium on the New Orleans and Gulf Coast Railway. The past had come alive in Belchase, and the sound of steam echoed off the levee and into